Probably some of you might know, but I was born in Bombay in an old Art Deco building uh, just off Pedder Road. I grew up in a dusty pink house in New Delhi, and um, you know there was a paper workshop next door, a bicycle repair shop. There was a man making chai, you know, just down the street. And I think that in a way, um, I grew up in a very sort of um, uh, in a very uh, plural way where contradiction for all of us really is really a part of our everyday life. Um, I then went on to NID uh, to study design and of course, you know, when you're growing up in India, you don't really know what design is, at least not when, when I was. And it was something that, you know, whenever you said to somebody you were doing design, they thought you were doing decoration. And for me, it was really interesting because, of course, I went to NID, I went to Ahmedabad, which was not a big metro like Bombay or Delhi. It still had a very indelibly old market, and yet it had this fantastic architecture with Corbusier and um, Louis Kahn, and you could see that the old market really coexisted with the modern, very modern architectural city. And it was quite, in a way, confusing because, of course, you know, a lot of the students were designing Scandinavian looking furniture or, you know, coffee makers that look like brown products and yet you stepped out of college and there was a guy sitting on the floor making chai in a patila, you know. And I think that, you know, it was also something that I always found hard to reconcile is that what we were really learning inside college sometimes had nothing to do with what was happening outside. Uh, I then went to the Rogue College and that's where I met Jonathan. So the work that I'm going to show you today is I've taken a selection of projects because the time is short. To really not show the end product as such, of course you'll see the end product, but really to talk you through the way we work together, how we bring our different cultures together, where we bring craft and production together. You know, so there's a lot of um, uh, ideas also of the ephemeral and, and the physical, and how we work very much with the hand and also uh, with digital technology. One of the first projects, in a way, that really exposed our studio to, um, you know, the, the international world of design was a very humble project, in fact, that we started with an Italian manufacturer called Moroso. And Jonathan and I, you know, apart from doing commercial work, we also do a lot of exploration and experimental and self-initiated projects. And one of the projects that we'd done was, in fact, a very simple uh, mattress uh, which had the game uh, of Chopar embroidered on it. And the idea was that the bed becomes an interactive space where you play a game. And Patrizia Moroso, she's one of the, I would say, giants in design. She saw this project, and it was literally a mattress at that point. And she said, well, you know, go to India and make it. So I worked with a workshop of about uh, 50 craftspeople, it's a workshop that's run by my aunt in Ahmedabad. And we started working with very, very fine Indian craftsmanship and combining it with Italian uh, industrial production. Now what I really wanted to talk about this project is that how, uh, when you work with the Italians, it's not really this relationship between a client and a designer. Italy is the only place in the world where design really is integral to, to manufacturing and industry. And when you talk to your Italian clients, they really talk about a collaboration and working together. And someone like Patrizia Moroso is, is an art historian. So she can start a project, and it's a commercial manufacturer, you know, furniture. But she will look at the artistic intent of a project and say, yeah, let's work with it, and let's explore, and let's see uh, how it can go forward. So the Chartwork collection really, in a way, is a combination of not just cultures. When this project was, in fact, launched at Salone del Mobile in 2007, I remember the stand was really mobbed, and there were thousands of people, you know, who were touching the pieces. And, you know, it really made me think that, in a way, the more cultural and more local the design is, the more universal appeal it has. While I was working in the workshop with the, the women in Ahmedabad, they used to sit on these little cushions on the floor and, you know, working with their tools. And uh, so I, I thought of doing a cushion which was tools of inspiration. So we took very everyday humble objects that they use for sewing, for uh, cooking, um, to make chai, and, and, and you know, uh, so we made a series of cushions also as an experimental uh, project. And, um, you know, I just wanted to show you 
the amount of work that goes into uh, craftsmanship in India. I think that we always think that in India, if something's handmade, somehow it should be, it should be cheap. But I always feel that the way for Indian craft is, in fact, to do such high luxury, because for me, the hand is the ultimate luxury. Of course, you know, being from India and working not in India, you know, everyone always thinks that India is, is traditional, it's old, it's very cultural, and, you know. But I think that also what a lot of people don't realize, that, of course, modernity is as intrinsic to India as the traditions and, and, and you know, sort of our crafts and things like that. So last year, we wanted to work on something that was a very spatial project that was looking at the, uh, the city of Chandigarh, designed by Corbusier. And I was particularly interested in the facade of the building, for me, which made, it, made a fantastic pattern. And I also wanted to do, in fact, a furniture piece which felt generic, which felt almost something that belonged to that space. So I was looking at a lot of the facades and you know, the technique that uh, Corbusier used to block sunlight, to, come, to, to get the light, but to block the sun coming into the space. This is the Mill Owners Association building in Ahmedabad. And the project really started it, with this drawing, which is an abstraction of, of the pattern. And it was something that we wanted to print also on the leather that would uh, be work, uh, upholstered on the sofa. So the way Jonathan and I normally work together is that to be honest, I work more on the feeling of an object or an idea. And he's somebody who's really um, very hands-on and, and, and has a very good understanding of materials and, and technology. So these are just literally very small mock-ups that we make in the studio. I guess it's what we found, that, and we've been really lucky with this, that we don't have to do fancy renders to show our client what a product or a project could look like. You could show a simple sketch, and, and it's really important um, that when you're working with somebody, that their imagination, in fact, is better than yours. And what we found is that the best work that we've done is for clients who've given us projects which we've never worked on before, which is, in a way, very unlike India. You know, if you, in India, if you want to design a car, they want to see have you designed 12 cars before. But uh, in Europe, and especially in the US, you know, people are really, clients are really looking at creativity, and they're so in tune with what creative people can do. You can also see that a lot of the forms in this piece are not something that you could uh, make on the computer. You know, so these are handmade models, literally sculpting foam. And these are one to five little scale models. And a lot of the craftsmanship, in fact, is going in the ideas and the initial process. And then it's industrialized. So in this case, it's injection molded polyurethane, which allows you to have the sofa literally you know, just resting on one point. I draw a lot, and um, also I think like a lot of Indian miniature painters, and uh, I actually think in 2D. And um, so it was interesting that I, of course, spent my entire education everywhere, being told that I was really bad at drawing because I couldn't do perspective. I didn't know how to see, do perspective. A circle was a circle for me. It could never be an ellipse. And I started really studying Indian miniature paintings, and it became a big source of inspiration for me. And this is a painting of a couple sitting on lots and lots of cushions, which was, in fact, the starting point of my beautiful backside sofa. So in this project, in fact, you know, we wanted to do, most of the sofas, of course, are really ugly, especially from the back. And we wanted to create a piece in a way that Although it started from the miniature painting and had the spirit of lots and lots of cushions, in a way, I think we also tried to make sure that it didn't look Indian and didn't have such a strong rooted cultural identity. And I think for me, it's really important that when I work with, um, uh, you know, uh, the inspiration, for example, coming from something that I love about India, for me, it's really important that the end product doesn't look Indian. It doesn't have to, in my opinion. Um, but you can see a reference, or there's a memory of, of where the piece comes from. And you can see the back of the sofa as well. You can see there are like series of floating cushions. And there's a likeness to the piece. And, um, and when we started doing this project, you know, we didn't realize that, of course, it's very complex to do a piece like that. And how do you upholster it? And when you have so many materials coming together, 
you know, uh, how, how does a piece work? We worked with wool and we printed the back, we foiled it in silver, and this piece, in fact, has about 10 or 12 different fabrics in, in each piece, but you don't really sense that there are a lot of materials and colors coming together. And at the back of the sofa, sofa you can see it says Circa 08 or Circa 08, sort of also giving a sense of layers of detail. So when you have a piece of furniture or product, I think for me it's something that you want to discover and love over time and use it. And, and somehow the more it ages, the more you love it. And you can see the, the, the piece in a very, very modern uh, Italian house. And you can see also the details of the buttoning, where you have Moroso, for example, the logo with the silver foil printing on wool, or DL and, and, and you know, the, the, the layers on it. Sometimes, of course, the starting point could be, uh, you know, a cultural starting point. Sometimes it could be a material. And this is a very interesting material that we, we discovered, which is called liquid wood. It's 100% biodegradable plastic, so to speak. It's completely made out of wood. And you can see it almost feels like leather. It stains because, of course, this material has uh, water in it. So it's able to, uh, so when you mold the material in a big plastic mold, the water comes out and stains the material. And of course, for us, it was fantastic because we didn't really want to do a plastic chair because we didn't want to do another great looking, slick looking plastic chair. So we realized that in fact, this material actually gave us a reason to design a plastic chair. And because it smells of wood, it looks like wood and leather. We thought that maybe our chair needs to feel like it's constructed rather than molded in one smooth, homogenous piece. So this is in fact a sculpture of Martin Puria. He's a black American artist, and we love the way he's constructed this, uh, this sculpture. And of course we started drawing, and we really liked the idea of the chair not being perfect, the chair having stains, but it's something that also can be injection molded. And I really like the way, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you can see on, uh, on the sketches, but it says Shanti Mumbai. And I really wanted to have the feeling that this piece really felt like it was constructed. And you can see that how we work. We'll work on very small little mock-ups in the studio. They're paper models, or sometimes we use even a uh, plaster of Paris and we lay it on, um, you know, on a little mold that we'll make in the studio. And just experimenting with what the shape wants to be because we really didn't want it to be so good looking. And of course, you know, we also sort of look at the projects, we reject them because we think, oh, you know, it looks like Y France or, you know, so there's a lot of experimentation that goes on before you see the final product. We make a lot of full-size mock-ups in the studio using very humble materials. For example, this is cardboard, you know, you just strip, you know, you bend the, the material, you can try it on. And then of course you have the final product. In this project, what was really interesting was that we wanted to use liquid wood, which is completely 100% wood. But in fact, by the time it came to the chair, of course this chair was impossible to make in wood, so it was called impossible wood. And um, it was impossible to make in plastic because it was very thin strips. And um, it in fact became impossible to make in the material that we started off with. And in the end, it had to be poly polypropylene and, and fiberglass. But I think what was really interesting was that the intention was there and we really did a lot of experimentation to work with the material. And I think it doesn't matter in the end if you cannot make a piece in the end that's going to be 100% biodegradable wood. But it in fact became an impossible wood chair. But it's in production now, it's in, it's in plastic. So at one level, we probably failed. This was a really interesting project where uh, we were invited by Swarovski to use crystal. Now, any self-respecting designer, in fact, dreads using crystal. And, uh, and of course, we said crystal, oh my God. How do we use crystal so that nobody can see the crystal? You know, but we, 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 we use it in, in some way. So this project, in a way, started with someone saying to us, okay, use crystal in a way that designers will like crystal, rather than making huge chandeliers and, and very show-off projects. So we said, okay, of course, what is really nice about crystal is the light. You don't really want to see the crystal. You want to see the light emanating from it. And we said, okay, let's print crystal on wool. So that wool is a material that really absorbs light, and crystal is something that emits light. And we made very, very narrow 
lines of crystal on a piece of fabric. And then we started experimenting. We almost thought of it as a piece of paper. So we made a graph paper. We started cutting it, uh, putting it together, almost like pattern cutting. Uh, and then again, we started making these sort of mock-ups in the studio and, and really also playing with, I love tailoring and I love uh, the, the logic of pattern cutting and, and the trade and the skill that goes with it. And this was ultimately the fabric that's on the chair. And when you in fact see the chair, you don't see the crystal. The chair just reflects the light of the crystal. And we also created a jacquard for this piece. Um, uh, I worked with a very good uh, Indian textile designer on this project. And you can see the, the, the final project. And I think that in this case, it was really um, uh, challenging, you know, what you think is good taste or, you know, suddenly being given a material that you don't really enjoy working with. And, and I think that we always sort of, the way Jonathan and I think is we always think we have to love the product. If we don't love it, there's no way the person we are working with is going to love it and the person who's going to buy it. So in some ways, I think it's going quite contrary to what marketing people say, that they know the market. Well, if you know the market, you're always just looking at what's already out there. And I think that it's really important to, in fact, ignore marketing people, and we always ignore marketing people, to really do something that, um, uh, you know, essentially you have to like it as a designer. There's no consumer out there who's different from you. You are the consumer. I think we design for people rather than consumer. We work with Cappellini, and it's really interesting for me because a lot of the people from uh, the Italian Alta Gama are here, and of course, we have been really supported by the Italian design industry. Um, not so much the UK. Uh, uh, in fact, Jonathan and I don't have any projects in the UK. We work all around the world, but we are based in London. And this was a project that when we showed to Giulio Cappellini, uh, he came to the studio, and we'd made a mock-up. And this chair is called capo, which literally uh, means boss in Italian. And we, use, we think of furniture also as, as, a, as a piece that frames space and a person who's sitting on it. And this was literally like an upturned um, uh, collar of a finely suited, uh, you know, finely tailored jacket. And of course, we also had Giulio in mind. And the way we made the model was literally the project started with a sheet of paper. And the forms that are generated are something that you cannot generate on the computer. And I think that it's really important when you're designing, especially designing 3D things, I think it's impossible to do anything original if you're just going to work with digital tools. Because you can never understand how paper is going to bend when you, you know, unless you make it. And you can see that we make very quick mock-ups, and, and Julio came, he sat on the chair, the ergonomics were perfect, and he said, yeah, let's make it, you know. And this is just to show you the, you know, working with very poor materials, and I think a lot of people think that, oh, prototyping costs a lot of money, you know, you have to buy really expensive materials. I think it's, in fact, prototyping and mocking up can be a very quick, iterative process, and I think that I sketch on paper, whereas Jonathan, in fact, he sketches you know, with material. And the material tells you what it wants to do. In product design, often there are, you know, most people still sort of, industrial designers want to follow the form follows function um, uh, route. Whereas I think that design ideas and inspiration come from so many places. And this was a project, it's called Kali. It's for a huge industrial uh, manufacturer in Germany called Authentics. And they came to us to do a bathroom collection. And of course, whenever you look at a bathroom collection, everything is matching, everything is white, and everything is in cheap, awful plastic material. And we thought, well, we imagined the, the, the collection that we were going to do almost as a, as a graphic composition of objects that you've collected over a period of time, some little piece in Bakelite maybe that you found in a second-hand market, or a little piece from your mother. And you know, that's how we actually live. We don't design our house and move in. You know, we collect objects over a period of time. So this was the initial sketch of sort of starting with the painting of Gert and Uwe Tobias, and really beginning to sketch the sort of composition of, of elements uh, around it. And then this, of course, is, um, is, the, is the collection where you have a bathroom cabinet, and it's a very huge injection molded piece. And of course, although it's a bathroom collection, we had engineers from BMW who in fact worked out 
the, the molding inside. It's a very big plastic molding. And you can see that, uh, in a way, Kali is very much, I thought of like, almost like a, you know, Kali with lots and lots of tools in her hand. So you start with the cabinet, and then you have all these arms sort of uh, coming through into the cabinet, injecting into the cabinet. And that's the, the, the collection, which uses, in fact, so many different types of plastics. It uses polypropylene, ABS, polycarbonate, melamine, you know. So I think that also it's very important that when you do a collection that you really explore a material and introduce decoration and I think that, or a sense of detail. And I think that it's really important in a way that it's, that industrial products have detail because it doesn't cost you anything to produce the detail a million times or a thousand times. We work across a lot of uh, different areas. Some of our products, like Authentics, you know, it sells for 10 euros, or, or Soap Dish for 5 euros. But equally, Jonathan and I thought, well, we live in London. We don't have any clients. We have to fly whenever we have to go and have a meeting, or, or you know, when we, we, we are working with, uh, uh, with companies. It, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually work with a, a workshop that is just next door? So we thought, well, what is Britain really known for um, in terms of making? And we thought, that we realized that actually what Britain is really good at is fine craftsmanship when it comes to men's grooming. So, you know, you have the Savile Row, you have John Lobb shoes, and you have the Fox umbrellas. And we thought that it would be our dream project, in fact, to design shoes with John Lobb. It's a family company that's been going for maybe three, four hundred years. And they take great pride in saying that nothing has changed in the last 200 years. They make shoes for Nelson Mandela, for Lakshmi Mittal, you name it, Tom Cruise. You know, he has one inch inside his shoe. And, you know, so it's a very sort of bespoke company where they sculpt the last to each of your feet. And, and, and they're very, very bespoke shoes. But of course, when we go to Lobb, we thought, well, we'll use fantastic new materials. Everything in their cabinet is so boring. You know, they all, you know, all the shoes for women look like they were made for the queen, and they are made for the queen. So we proposed to them, and it's the project's called Apprentice. And, um, and of course, it was something, a shoe is something that is almost like architecture, because it's so close to, uh, you know, your body and the structure and the construction and, and how it has to last and, and so many other areas uh, around it. So we entered almost through this, almost through this hole into another fantastic world of, of bespoke shoemaking. So we started very much, you know, with thinking, oh, we'll use plastics and fantastic colors and materials. And the moment you start working with these craftspeople, you realize that they have this knowledge of leather and material, which is simply mind-blowing, and we could really learn from them. And the design intervention in this project was really, really minimal. It was really trying to see how can you design without designing. Uh, this shoe is called Perfect, and it's uh, you know, a whole cut crocodile shoe, cost 6,000 pounds to make. And it's called Perfect because it was the shoe that I expected to see in their cabinet, an archetype of a shoe. Then we did another, we did two pairs of shoes for men and two for women. And you can see here the craftsman is, uh, you know, putting the upper. There are seven people involved in making a shoe, you know, right from the person who makes your last to the person who uh, sculpts, uh, who takes your measurements, who sculpts the last, then there's a person who in fact makes the, cuts the, the clicker is the person who cuts the leather. And the clicker really knows how to take the patterns that are made for the shoe. Then you have of course the pattern cutter, then you have the person who sews the upper, and the shoemaker is in fact the person who puts the upper on the sole and, uh, and, and makes the sole. And then you have a polisher and a finisher, you see. So it's interesting that we think of shoes and we just, you know, we have no understanding of how, how a shoe is made, but there's so much craft and, and detail that goes into shoemaking. So what we wanted to do, because the shoes they do were so fusty and, you know, old fashioned, so we, we used the sort of the techniques, but we wanted to create a shoe that was more dandy, you know, it was more, it couldn't be fashionable because people wear these shoes for 20 years, but we really started playing with how a shoe is constructed and how you really emphasize the shape of the foot, because that shoe is made for you. 
this is the woman's shoe. When I was designing the, the women's shoes, I was di designing sandals. And, and they said, we don't like to design shoes for women because they change their mind. So I realized very quickly that they're not used to working with the kind of shoes we see in Louboutin or, you know, or, or, or Jimmy Choo. So we, I, I was really it was really challenging for me to do a pair of shoes that was feminine, which was sexy without being red, and yet had something quint quintessentially John Lobb about it. This is just to show you. We were the guest of honor um, at uh, IMM, which is a big uh, furniture uh, fair in Germany. And they invited us to create our perfect vision of a house, uh, our, our, perfect, our perfect house. And uh, we had about 2,000 square feet, and it was in the context of a fair. And what Jonathan and I very quickly realized that our idea of an ideal house was not something that was standing alone like a monument. And in fact, we started designing the house very much from the inside out. And I, of course, love the old markets uh, in India, in the old neighborhoods in Japan, you know, when you walk in Rome, for example, where you don't know where one building starts and another one ends. And depending on how you approach uh, the house, it changes. Uh, of course, also the idea that you don't dictate to somebody what a house looks like. It, our house was something that was author-based. It was designed by the people who were living in it. And as the family grew or the needs of the house grew, you, you, the house could grow with it. I also, in a way, I hate aspirational design. And I think that for me, there's a lot of beauty in stuff that we now call bad taste. And I think especially it's happening in India now. You look at our buildings, you look at all the new complexes, they are simply awful. And I think they have no, no sense of, you know, you have these show flats where everything is already in it. And that there's no sort of feeling of good design could be fractured. It could be dystopian. It could be imperfect. It could be something that's improvised. I love this, uh, uh, you know, uh, image of, of old Shanghai, where you can really see the sense of the way they've used the glass for the door. And for me, you know, in fact, it's more beautiful than, um, it shows the people who are living in it and how they want to live, rather than a, a, a fancy four BHK apartment. The transparency in a house to be able to look out and look in, and of course in India, a house is, you know, traditionally has been something where you have a lot of people coming into your house. So how do you create that sense of privacy in a home, which is actually a very public space? So we started very much with a very central courtyard, and we started the house from the inside. And all the activities are based around the courtyard. And no matter what you're doing in the house, you're always in constant contact with somebody else. And the facade of the house, in fact, was really just an outcome of how the spaces were designed internally. So you can see here in the center you have the courtyard, and the house was according to activities rather than rooms. So we looked at the salon, we looked at sleeping, dressing, well-being, bathing, cooking, workshop, and study. But I think it was also important for us that our, our house also had a public face to it. So maybe, like in a lot of mixed-use neighborhoods, uh, mixed neighborhoods, you have a workshop next to a house, and there is a real link between the economic and the social aspect um, uh, of a neighborhood. <clears throat> so we started, in a way, with the, uh, with the salon, which was a place, in fact, not just to entertain, but it was one of the house, uh, places in the house where you could just be. We didn't have any doors, so this idea is that if you're sitting on a charpoy or a daybed, you can almost sense the person coming in. And then living room or the salon space is connected to the bedroom, because for me, I think a bedroom is in fact a more intimate social space, a place where you hang out with your family, with your close friends. So it was very important for us that in fact the sleeping area was quite, next, uh, quite close to the place um, where you were receiving people. We created also, you can see now that every room, and this, of course, this is a dream house, no? so of course you don't have uh, doors and windows. 
And right next to the sleeping area, we had a space for dressing up. And it's something that I think that we are losing a lot now in the way we live, this time to spend time grooming, to look after ourselves. And I really like the idea that they don't have to be daily chores. They can be rituals. You know, you can do a simple thing like bathing, and there can be a real sense of enjoyment in that. And people always complain about not having time. But for me, when you're cooking, you have time. That is time. We created a dressing table called Chandlo. Um, so this is the dressing space. Um, and I love this, uh, uh, this image of Katia Bresson where you have the Maharani of Baroda, you know, and this lady is holding the mirror and she's very simply dressed. So which in fact was the starting point for Chandlo as well. And Chandlo in Gujarati also means Bindi. So we had this big Chandlo which is the mirror in the middle. And we imagine this dressing table to be more spatial rather than an object that you put against the wall. You can see there's a pink tinted mirror on mornings when you don't feel so great. You, know. you can see that the piece also works equally from, uh, from, from the back. We connected bathing with uh, the kitchen and cooking because, of course, you know, in India, a lot of ingredients that you bathe with are also ingredients, in fact, that you eat and you have in the kitchen. So we combined the bathing area. It's a spa that we've designed for an Italian company, and we combined it with the cooking area. And then, of course, it's your house. You can bathe outside in the courtyard. And then you can see also the, the, the meditation space, or space just to be where you sit on the floor, you don't have a lot of furniture, and the sofa, in fact, is in the courtyard. And you can see that the, the, the cabinet that we had with all the ingredients that, that come together. And you can imagine in the context of, of Germany, you know, people were like bathing and cooking. They couldn't imagine why you would have those two spaces together. And in fact, in a lot of Indian, traditional Indian homes, in fact, where you bathe was very close to where you cooked because you had a bath before you entered the kitchen. Then this table is called Manzai. And I think that nowadays, the way that we work and live, you know, somebody might be working on the dining table, you know, you're working on the table, your family's having a meal together. So we designed a table, in fact, which was, it's called Manzai, which is coming together. And um, so you have the dining space, and then you also have a workspace next to it. And you're eating in the courtyard, the most beautiful place in the house to eat. And you can see the view of the courtyard and, and then the see-through feeling of the rooms. And this is the shop selling our stuff. And this is the view of the house from the outside. Like I said to you at the beginning of the talk, that in fact you're relying so much on, on, on the people that you're working with to, to, to give you projects that you've never done before. And Camper, which is a manufacturer of shoe, is one of those companies, you know, which really if they, they invited us to do their interiors uh, uh, for, uh, you know, a series of their stores. And um, I don't want to talk about the store because it's a shoe store and the concept for us was, I hate stores, I, I hate interiors because in a way they look very good when you, know, you have them for 10 days and they photograph well and then you know, everything goes downhill from there. So I really wanted to do an interior first of all which had the solid sort of construction of the Spanish uh, towns. You know, so we use very authentic materials like marble, resin, you know, so I almost wanted the shop to feel like you could wash it and nothing happens to it. And then of course, you know, when you talk to the Italians and the, the, the Spanish people, they talk about how when they were growing up, they would have a television in their courtyard and the whole neighborhood would watch the television together. So it really gave us the idea that how about the television becoming the cash desk? It's almost like, you know, you have the camper uh, presenter uh, uh, taking money, uh, you know, from, uh, from the space. And of course, they, we did the shop, and they said, well, why don't you design shoes? You know, of course, we designed shoes, but I think that for me, it was really interesting that because they like the interior, they get you to do shoes that are for production, and they don't cost 3,000 pounds to make. So it was quite a challenge to do that. And this is just to show you how we mock up and how we present a shoe project um, in the studio. Uh, you can see, in fact, a sheet of paper, which was, in fact, just the absolute feeling that we wanted for the project. And then working on last, making mock-ups, and, and presenting ideas, uh, uh, ideas to them. This is the woman's pair of shoe. Of course, also in a case like Camper, you have to realize it is not Lob, you know, it isn't uh, Hermes. You know, they have to sell the shoe for 100 euros, so, so the constraints are very, very different. And these shoes are going to be launched in Milan um, uh, 
later this at, at Salone. Um, last year, Hagen Das came to us to design an ice cream. And we were like, okay, design an ice cream. Sure, why not? Um, but they said, of course, it's not easy to design an ice cream because it's, ice cream is a material. It needs to be molded. It's made at very, very low temperatures. And when you release it from a mold, I didn't even know that you had like really complex molds for ice creams. You have literally a second to drop hot water and you have to release it. So we said, okay, we take ice cream as a plastic, as a material that needs to be manufactured. And this was for Christmas. They launched it at Christmas um, 2012, that just went. And it's an ice cream cake, it's about, it's about that big, it's for 10 to 12 people. And the starting point for me <laughs> was this song, I don't know, maybe none of you know this because you're all too young. It was a film called Koop Surat, which had Rekha in it. And she had a song in that, where she's a children's song, where this, imagine if the moon was made out of ice cream. And it was something that really stayed in my head. And equally, the French film um, uh, Voyage de la Lune, which is about the journey to the moon. And we said, for ice cream, Christmas for children, let's make a moon. So this is the ice moon with the craters. And of course, for some of you here who are technical and know about molding, how do you mold a sphere and then release it in, in one piece? So in fact, the ice cream is made in two parts. Uh, it's two molds. And you can see again how in the studio, we literally got a lump of clay and started sculpting the piece and, um, and really trying to get a sense of uh, uh, you know, what it feels like. This is the ice cream. You can see the two molds. You can see it's made in two parts. And this is raspberry sorbet with pistachio uh, base and macadamia nuts and some other stuff that I don't know. And then we did another one, which is their classic salted caramel. And it's got the kesar uh, sprinkled on the top. I wanted gold dust on it, but it didn't meet the food standards. And it was a huge success. This is what I find really incredible. You do serious good design, and OK, you know, people who are interested in design uh, you know, appreciate your work. And, and then you do an ice cream, something as superficial as an ice cream, and then it really goes mental. And it really kind of shows you know, that, in a way, as designers, we have to, it's great to do stuff that's popular. And I love the fact that, you know, and it was, in the, it was in the Evening Standard in London, and everybody, you know, if you've been to London, everybody reads the Evening Standard on the Metro. You know, even uh, my boy's nanny was finally proud of what we were doing. And then somebody called and said to Johnny, Johnny, do you know you're on the cover of the Evening Standard? And he said, have I got any clothes on? Because that was his first, uh, you know, uh, reaction. But we loved the fact that we did something. We thought, ah, let's just do an ice cream high. It's going to be fun. And in fact, it's been one of our most well-received projects. And it also kind of, you know, we, when we started our studio, we decided we were not going to be specialists. And we still don't want to be specialists. But whenever we start a project, we become specialists in it. And there's a really great uh, opportunity to explore ideas and to really learn about new industries. <clears throat> This is just a final project that I want to show you, and I've probably taken, uh, uh, you know, I've gone beyond my time. We were invited by Quadrat, which is a, a very, very important Danish company, to do something with wool. I mean, it's hardly a brief. They make wool, and it's fantastic, but, you know, that was the level of the brief. We had to do something for their showrooms, and uh, it couldn't be a product because they supply textiles to the top companies in the world, but they don't, um, uh, they don't actually want to compete with their, their clients. So of course for me, wool is fantastic because I always think that the star sartorial qualities of wool are really, really beautiful. So we decided to do a series of puppets, giant puppets, uh, using the wool and creating sort of abstract shapes. It's almost like a circus. Um, or a, or a giant puppet show, and it's very inspired by the Bauhaus uh, parties. Of course, you know, what, 
a lot of us don't know is that in the Bauhaus, they had amazing themed parties where, uh, you know, people like Oskar Schlemmer, you know, he would dress up in this fantastic costume. So this was a starting point for, um, for the work that we did for them. Started with little maquettes making, uh, you know, almost human figures, um, you know, or you could, depending on where you were in the showroom, you could either see an eye or a face or a jacket or a horse with blinkers. And I just wanted to show you. We also made a film to show that it's almost like all these characters in a parade. Thank you very much.